continues to do today for the most part is to try to place people under bondage of rules and laws and things like that. But I want to tell you when Jesus when Jesus saves you, you're free. Amen? Amen. You're, Amen. Free. you're free indeed. Listen to what he says here about people in the church, people that know God that are failing. There's people, you you believe that tonight that there's people in the church that's failing? Amen. You look at one of the biggest failures there is right here. I deal with it all the time. But in chapter number 6, Paul writing, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaking in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. He doesn't say kick them out. He doesn't say put them down. He doesn't say put your holy religious foot on their neck and push them on down. He says, you that are spiritual, those of you that know, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself that you less also be tempted. Listen to what else he says. He says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What was the law of Christ? Carry our sins. Carry away our sins, but it was another law there. The law of Christ has to do with love. 
that you love one another. Jesus said over in His Word, He said, how will men know that you're My disciples? And then He'd give them the answer. He says, because you love the brethren. Turn around to somebody there next to you and tell them that you love them tonight. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. We got some first time visitors. Make sure and give them a hug and tell them that you love them. Also. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for everything you give us. Lord, we just ask for the mighty power of the Holy Spirit to move upon us tonight and touch us in this place. Lord, if there's anyone in this place that needs salvation tonight, then we ask that You would save them. We ask that they would find this holy Jesus that He would enter into their heart. Father, we ask if there's any sin in our life, if there's any shortcoming, if there's anything that's contrary to the moving of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives, then Lord, we ask that You would forgive us of it. Your precious blood that washes away sin, that covers all sins, past, present, and future. And we put our faith in that cross. We put our faith in the cross, which is our way to Christ, which is our way to the Father, our way to eternal life. Lord, we thank You for that. Touch each and every one. Touch me tonight, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we'll ask it. And the church said, Amen. 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 Praise the name of Jesus. My daddy... My daddy was a World War II veteran. My daddy was in the in the, the WW2. My dad was a military man. He uh he knew something about war. He knew something about suffering humanity. In the 21 years that my dad served in the military, 19 of those years was spent on the water on a battleship, on an aircraft carrier. My dad had been around the world several times in all those tours. My dad had sat in the desert with the Arabs and ate what they had ate. My dad had been to the third world countries and he had seen people who did not have nothing. My dad was always thankful for what we did have even though we were on a fixed income and we didn't have a whole lot of of anything. But my dad understood that everybody here on this side lives like kings and queens, whether we realize it or not. I took a little survey a couple of weeks ago with some of y'all and I asked you how many TVs you got, how many microwaves you got, how many cars you got. We found out that me and Dwight McFarland own way too many material possessions. And uh but but Truth of the matter is, is my dad knew what it looked like for suffering humanity. My dad used to tell a story to people all the time about freedom. About when the POWs that was freed from Germany came aboard their ship. Emaciated, skinny, poor. They were repatronizing these POWs, these World War II POWs that had been thrown into this, these prison camps, these Nazi concentration camps. And they were liberated. They, the Allied armies of World War II had went into France and they had liberated France. My dad said that when they liberated France that those people was coming out in the streets and they were hugging the soldiers because they were liberators. They were there to make them free. There was great joy. There was great excitement in the middle of that. When they brought those POW prisoners aboard their ships and they were repatronizing them and bringing them back into the U.S., America, my dad said he saw some of those prisoners that had went without food, that was skin and bones, that was sick. He said he saw those prisoners grabbing those sailors on that ship and hugging them and kissing them and with tears streaming down their face with what great joy. What great joy that they had that they had been liberated. That they had been made free from their imprisonment. 
And I think a lot of times about you and I that have been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Been given to us freely. Freely for you and I. A great cost for the one who paid the price for you and I on the cross of Calvary. One thing that I noticed in all those stories was my dad never ever mentioned that any of those prisoners came aboard that ship and said, I'm mad about this whole thing. Some of them missing limbs. Some of them about to die. Some of them just skin and bones. Some of you that have watched some of that. Some of these kids are too young to know about it. When my kids see it on TV, they cut it off because it makes them cry. But I live with a man that's seen it firsthand. I live with a man that had walked into some of those concentration camps and had seen the furnaces and seen the places where men and women had perished. I live with a man who could tell those stories about those things, but I never once ever heard my dad ever mention about any of those people walking on the gangplank and walking into the ship and saying, I'm angry and I'm mad about this whole thing that has happened to me. No, they wasn't, they wasn't angry or mad about being starved or, or losing a limb. They were so overjoyed with freedom. They were so overjoyed with being rescued that the past didn't matter anymore. Can I tell you that if you know Jesus tonight and you've been saved by the precious blood of Jesus, the past is the past. Forget about the past. You can't dwell on the past, but you can sure celebrate and have joy for what's happened to you right now. That Jesus Christ by the cross of His, by His cross has made you free. Made you free. There ought to be joy in our life that one time I was in bondage. That's how come I... It drives me nuts to go to a church and hear somebody that gets up that maybe was in prison or maybe was on drugs or something. And it just seems like they just glorify, glorify that past life. Yeah, I was a, I was a meanest drug dealer, blah, 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 blah. I was a, I was a, I was a tough one. Blah, blah, blah. You ain't Jack anymore. You ain't Jack. Because Jesus took all that away. Why glory in the place you used to be? Why not glory in where you're at right now? He's an on time God. Yeah. Right now He's dealing with you. Amen. Somebody said, well, I'm just waiting for eternity. Honey, you're living in eternity. Right. If you've been bought by the blood of Jesus and made a living soul, welcome to eternity. Amen. Amen. Ain't nothing no man can do to you. If you've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ and your sins have been washed away, you don't have to worry about what you did in the past. Don't let the devil come around and beat you with something that happened a long time ago. Realize that you're a child of God bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit made free by Him tonight. Oh, come on now. Y'all asleep. I'm going to go find me some Baptists to preach too. Lord, they'll get happy with you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. There ain't a one of us in this place that hasn't failed the Lord. Not a single one of us. Sinner or saint. Not a single one of us that hadn't messed up somewhere or another down the road. Amen. Amen. You know what I loved about these people whenever I first got them? And there's only a few of them here now because we growed. But what I loved so much about them was they were broken. So you got to be broken before God can use you. Amen. I've heard musicians, I've heard people say, Lord, just think if that guy got saved, what he could do for the Lord. I said he can do nothing for the Lord. Because the Lord can't use your talents and your abilities. The Lord has to take you and crush you. Some of you have been going through a crushing here lately. I, I know because I've talked to you. I've, I've gotten some of your phone calls and Andy says I don't return phone calls. He's probably right about that. I told poor old Kathy back there one time, don't call me and pray for you unless your head's cut off. <laughs> and two days ago, I was ready to cut her head off. <laughs> we ain't going to talk about that though, are we, sis? But anyhow... God's a good God. And what I loved about you was that 
We were all a broken people. You've got to be broken. That alabaster box that, that Mary uh, ministered in and, and anointed Jesus with before He went to the cross. You would have never known that that alabaster box had been in the room except she broke it. And what happened whenever Mary broke that box to anoint Jesus with it? Well, there was a beautiful fragrance that entered the room. Everybody could smell in that room that something had been broken. They recognized it as alabaster that had been broken. Did you know that there is nothing more beautiful that a child of God that has went through a broken place in their life. They've been, they've been broken. It's part of God's process to, to mold and to make you to where He brings you to a place where you cannot depend upon any of your talents or any of your abilities. You cannot, you cannot depend upon your, your, your knowledge. And maybe your ability to be able to accomplish something of your own. No, God takes and He begins to strip things out of your life. That's the problem. We don't like the stripping. We don't like the being torn down part. We don't like the, the suffering part. We don't like the part to where things are taken away from us. We don't like that part to where we, we feel helpless. But listen, His strength is made perfect in what? We, our weakness. When we come to that place where we're weak, when we come to that place where we cannot depend upon anything that we possess or anything that we have, but we can only fall upon our knees and ask the Lord to help us, ask the Lord to strengthen us, ask the Lord to anoint us, ask the Lord to, to give us the, the mercy and the grace to be able to make it through the place that we're at. And then the Lord looks and He says, you know what, I can, I can do something in that person's life now. That's why I've always said, listen, don't look to yourself, don't look to the church, don't look to the preacher, don't look to the deacon board, but look to Jesus. Yes. Look to Jesus Christ and Him crucified, raised from the dead. Yeah. Because right there is where mine and your power and mine and your strength come from. I don't understand it. I don't understand how come Jesus died upon a cross. I don't understand how my sins are washed away. I don't understand how that whenever I look to Him and what He has accomplished for me, how that the Holy Spirit says I can honor that faith. I don't understand all them things. But also I don't understand electricity. But that doesn't stop me from turning the light on when I go in the house. Amen? I don't understand how... They generate it and how they transfer it. Now some of you brainy people might. But one thing I know is if I paid the bill... And I have paid the bill, right? <laughs> I know you got to find out to get home. Like Lois did. But I know if I go in the house and I flip the light switch, the light's going to come on. Well, now listen, I know that God is faithful. I know that God holds up to His end of the bargain. And if I go to Calvary, if I go to that place where He saved me, and I believe upon Him, God is faithful. Yeah. Our problem is we get in the way. Yeah. We get in the way of the grace. We get in the way of the, the grace flowing. This is one of the things Paul dealt with here with the Galatian church because religious people came in. And they said, look, you can have your Jesus if you want Him. But you're going to have to start keeping the law. Well, don't we do the same thing in the modern church? Yeah. Well, you can have Jesus, but listen, if you're going to keep Jesus, this is what you've got to do. You've got to do it by the way we say to do it. Amen. Or you've got to do it by the way the deacon boards voted it in. Or you've got to live by the covenant. Right? Those big rules, or yeah. big covenant promises on the side of the wall yeah. of the church. I'm just not even going to comment on that. It's... Come on. Go ahead. You know you're going to tear it up. You know it. It's almost as bad as that number forward on the back of the church. <laughs> Don't even get Katie Weeks started on that one. I'm telling you, we have traveled all over the place. 
But when you travel all over the place and you go to all kinds of churches and preach and sing and then different denominations, boy, does it ever let you see through the smoke of religion. Amen. I'm telling you what, folks, we live in the last days here on this earth. You better, better have your eyes on Jesus and not worry about what the name on the door is. Amen. One of these days the trump's going to sound, and if you don't know Jesus, you ain't going. You can be a Baptist, a Methodist, a Holiness. You can claim yourself of every kind of stripe there, there ever was. But if you don't know Jesus and really know Him as your Lord and your Savior, you'll be sitting right there in your pew. Yeah. Somebody posted a picture on Facebook and something about the, he said the rapture had helped me and stuck a sign out in front of it and said, Lord, what are people going to do? And I commented back and I said, well, if we read that sign, we're in just as bad a shape as they are. <laughs> Amen? Jesus is coming back for a pure and a holy church. But it's not going to be a pure and a holy that we make it. It's going to be a church that by faith is looking unto Christ. By faith is trusting in Jesus and what He did on the cross of Calvary. By faith, holding on to His promises. Not some religious routine that we have come up with. Because listen, rules and regulations and people coming along with their holier than thou attitudes is not going to get you one foot in the door of heaven. It's only going to be by grace. You know what I love about it? <coughs> You know what I love about it is that there's people that are saved that most of the church world would look at them and say they're not going. But boy, are they going to be surprised at who all is really going to be there. I think we'd be shocked at who will be there and who won't. Amen? Amen. 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 That's why it's important for people like you and I that are spiritual to help people that are fallen. Help restore those. Help encourage those. Help those to keep on going. Keep on trucking for the Lord. Keep on believing. Keep on having faith in what Christ has done. Because it's all by mercy and it's all by grace. Or none of us would be saved. Amen? I think we ought to be like those prisoners, man. We ought to be so joyful in our life that we're not worried about this or that. We're just glad that we've been made free by the blood. We're so glad that we're just a child of God and that we love Him and that He loves us. Do you know God loves you tonight? Amen. I love you. I love you. God's a good God. You know what I love? Another thing I love about the God is He is right here. He's not over yonder somewhere. He's right here with me. He's right here with you. 24 hours a day. He knows everything about your life. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows you better than your preacher and thinks He knows you. He knows what you're capable of and what you're not capable of. And Sometimes I'm scared because I know what I'm capable of. And it's not good. Amen. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you'll never get to a place in your life where you don't fight the flesh on this side. There's always going to be something that's going to be hindering you. Some of you are going to be worried and you say, Oh Lord, I, I wish I had a hunger for God. I, I, wish, I, wish, I, could, I wish I could get to that place where, the, where the, I, I'm, I'm hungry for the Lord. Well, hey, if you're saying that, guess what? You're hungry. Sound to me like you're a little bit on the hunger side. Amen? See, I believe there's a heart's desire in everybody in this room to serve the Lord and to walk with Him. But some of you feel like that you've been letting the Lord down lately. But folks, I want to tell you something. If there's a desire to love Him, a desire to walk with Him, a desire to serve Him, hey, you're on the right road. Amen? Amen. Some people go around fighting the devil all the time and they're not fighting the devil. God's letting you go through those things. God's letting you go through those tests and through those trials. He's doing two things. He's trying to bring you closer to Him and He's teaching you about His mercy and His grace. Amen. Amen. You'd never have life except you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You wouldn't know what victory's about unless you went through a struggle. Am I right? Amen. And wow, what a change I've seen happen in people's lives. I've seen changes in your lives. 
I've looked out over the last seven years over this congregation of people, and I have seen some mighty, mighty great changes. Well, there's people that uh, the first week we ever had one of these meetings, I said, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into here? <laughs> these people, it, it would take a, a miracle of the parting of the Red Sea for some of these people to ever know what church was. But what I found out was, is there was people there that was already hungry for God. There was people there that wanted to know that there was a God who still loved them regardless of their past, regardless of the struggles, regardless of the shortcomings. Some of you, some of you was probably sitting out on the tailgate in the yard smoking a doobie while I was up there preaching. And God was saying, I love you. I know we had some beer because Tristan found it in the cooler. I know we had some beer at the prayer meeting. You wouldn't believe some of the flack that I've called over y'all. Preachers saying, when you going to start a real church? Well, that bunch of heathens you got down there. Y'all ain't back. That baptismal video that we done where we baptized 27 people, you ought to go back on my YouTube page and see all the flack that I caught over that by people saying, you didn't baptize them right. <laughs> we had people that professed they knew Jesus. We had water. As the biblical guy said, well, who should forbid that he be baptized? We got water. <laughs> Was I your judge? No. I know some of you went down and came up just as dirty as you did when we went down. <laughs> but I got news for you, it ain't the water that cleans you up anyway. And and I had some that said I, that you wasn't really saved because I didn't baptize you in the name of Jesus only. But we said, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen. We covered all the bases. Amen. I even had one preacher that was saying the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost in Jesus. He is really covered it on the other side. You see how religion can mess up your freedom that you have in Christ? When you get to start trying to draw lines in the sand and say, this is right, this is wrong, boy, you get in trouble over that. I, I've, had, I've had folks that, that said, well, did you know you've got a couple of child molesters in your, in your group? I said, well, I do now. <laughs> right, they was, but they ain't now. God's done work in their life. Well, that bunch of tattooed, <laughs> holes pierced, hot smoking, drinking, in and out of the church, bunch of folks that you got. I was like, you know, the Lord gave them to me. Who do you got? Some stuffy old church members been saved 40 years and had never done nothing for God but sit and tell their husbands what to vote for on the deacon board meeting? <laughs> I mean, my goodness, somewhere or another you got to cut through the religious smoke and realize that people are hurting. Right. And people are hungry for something. And, and God, God placed this, this desire inside man and woman to worship. Man's going to worship something. There's no real atheist. There's people that say they don't believe there's God, but they believe there's a God. They believe there's a God. There's no real atheist. Everybody deep down on the inside knows that there is a God. You know why they know there is a God? Because it's in you. It's innately put in you. 
We are made to worship. We are made to serve a living God, not a dead God. Amen. We, are, we are made to serve a, a living, omnipresent, all-knowing and all-powerful God. And He exists. Amen. And He's with you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. But we just take Him for granted. A lot of times. I'm trying to get to this point in my life where I'm grateful for everything that I have. And I miss it some days. Some days I jump out of bed and I'm a one track mind person and I think about all the work I got to do and I don't say howdy to nobody. I just drink my protein shake, drink my espresso, take a sip of Coke and I'm out in the yard with the tools. And about 10 o'clock I think, oh yeah Lord, thank you. And then some mornings I wake up early in the morning and I say, Lord, the one you love is awake. Amen. 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 See, praying without ceasing is really having a life to where you're grateful for God Amen. and what He's done for you. And you're thankful. You're thankful. I, I tell you what, folks, if you'll be more thankful for what you have than you, what you need, you'll start seeing things happen in your life. You'll start seeing the abundance and the grace of God taking hold in your life. Let me tell you something. God created you and I in such a way that whatever we focus on is going to grow. You ever heard anybody that all they ever do is talk about being sick? And it's almost like they brag about it. And they're always sick. They attract sickness. They bring it home with them. They multiply sickness. It just comes on them and overtakes them. And God have mercy. I'm sick. And we've all been sick. We've all been sick. But what if we focus on the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God and what we do have? You see, I'm going to tell you something. If all you do, this is why God don't like grumbling and murmuring and complaining. How many of you got friends that all they ever do is complain? Good Lord, y'all got relationship illness. Y'all need to get away from them people. There might be some of you in here you need to get away from each other. 